The final, that's the, the Panmure House, the final remaining home of the philosopher and economist Adam Smith. Like Smith, 200 years before her, Caroline attended the University of Glasgow before undertaking postgraduate study at Baylor College, uh, where she wrote her doctoral thesis, and she wrote her doctoral thesis at St Andrews on romance in the prose of Robert Louis Stevenson. Right, she's speaking to us today about romance, pleasure and well-being. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Hi, everyone. Um, there are three fulcrums to my talk today. Number one is that Stevenson's perception of romance is fundamentally built into his practice as a writer. And I'll demonstrate this through some close attention to his essays. Number two is that romance and pleasure are intrinsically linked for Stevenson. And indeed, this is where the essential value of romance comes from for him. Number three is that Stevenson's understanding of the positive utility of romance prefigured the 20th century establishment of the medical humanities and bibliotherapy specifically. Did everyone catch that? Would you like me to go through again? Good. Maybe repeat, yeah. yeah. You want me to repeat? Yes, yeah. Okay, so three points. The first is that Stevenson's perception of romance um, is fundamentally built into the way that he writes. And I'll demonstrate this using his essays. Number two is that romance and pleasure are intrinsically linked and that this is where the value of romance derives from for, for Stevenson. And the third is that Stevenson's understanding of the positive utility of romance prefigured the 20th century establishment of the medical humanities and bibliotherapy specifically. Okay, so it's a fair bit to get through in 20 minutes. To my first point. Um, across his essays and letters, these are just some of the different ways in which Stevenson describes romance and its qualities throughout his career. He calls it the poetry of circumstance, characterized by striking events. It's a generative artistic idea, but concerned with practical intelligence. It's buoyant, but primal. It's a game, often one of hide and seek. It's linked memorably to the feeling of a surprise I had expected. But most radically, romance emerges as a cognitive style, a learned skill, a perception, a mode of thought, a kind of way of looking at the world that outlasts textual parameters and influences the way that we read our own experience. And we'll come back to that later in the talk, but I'd like to expand for a moment on the ways in which romance itself is intrinsic to Stevenson's whole practice as a writer. These are the nine essays that have the most to offer us by way of uh, insight into Stevenson's thinking on romance. And they span most of his career, uh, beginning in 1874 with the very underrated piece, Victor Hugo's Romances. Stevenson judged this essay to mark the beginning of his own command of style, uh, according to Graham Balfour. He said that it was in this essay that he first found himself able to say several things in the way he felt they should be said. In the essay itself, Stevenson discusses his theory of a principle of growth that exists within the work of an author, which is paralleled by the wider literary developments uh, of an age. When you examine that principle of growth within Stevenson's own work, it's striking to see the force and consistency with which uh, he prioritizes romance and its positive potential. Now, I, I won't go into detail looking at every single one of these essays, but I will home in on some examples from the beginning, middle, and end of that list to give you a sense of that consistency over time. So we'll start with Victor Hugo's romances. Now, in this essay, he writes that romance is a language in which many persons learn to speak with a certain appearance of fluency, but there are few who can ever be said to bend it to any practical need, few who can never be said to express themselves in it. And neatly captured here are three vital concerns, all of which remained with Stevenson throughout his career. <coughs> 
The first is this understanding of romance as a language, a kind of cognitive skill that can be learned and then deployed in various contexts. So languages consist in a set of conventions which are practiced and absorbed over time so thoroughly that we use them almost unconsciously. And Stevenson's representation of romance as a language suggests that for him, its ancient codes of meaning shape literature at the most basic level. Once it's been learned, its grammar and vocabulary become instinctual to a degree. And because language is the medium of the writer, if romance is a language that you're using, then it effectively becomes part of your style that is baked into the task of writing itself. And here's a fine example of that in his essay on style, where he writes that the beauty of the contents of a phrase or of a sentence depends implicitly upon alliteration and upon assonance. The vowel demands to be repeated. The consonant demands to be repeated. And both cry aloud to be perpetually varied. You may follow the adventures of a letter through any passage that has particularly pleased you. Find it, perhaps, denied a while to tantalize the ear, find it fired again at you in a whole broadside, or find it pass into congenerous sounds, one liquid or labial melting away into another. So Stevenson observes not only a language of romance, but a romance in language that functions at the micro level, and which turns this sentence into a microcosm of conscious poetic activity. It's a miniature quest narrative, in fact. Um, his vowels and consonants are figured as sentient, demanding, and mobile. The emphasis on repetition is itself repeated, and then it's subsequently varied, a process that's demonstrated while it's being described in that second sentence. And this then culminates in the trajectory of the final sentence with that opening broadside of plosives, any passage that has particularly pleased you, and then the tantalizing midsection roped off by semicolons, and that final dissolution into a fluidity of L's, what he calls a liquid or labial melting. So romance for Stevenson is inherent in the act of writing itself and the exploratory or questing energy that drives it at a stylistic level. Linked to this, going back to that sentence from Victor Hugo's romances, is the challenge of expressing oneself adequately. The inability of language to fully render our conceptual intent is something that preoccupies Stevenson enormously um, and it's reflected many times throughout his work as I'm sure you all know from his essays through to the structures of texts like Jekyll and Hyde or The Master of Ballantrae where absences and things unspoken really drive the plot. And if language itself is an imperfect medium, then again this questing energy of romance exists in the act of writing. Stevenson closes the essay on the technical elements of style by saying that perfect sentences are rare and perfect pages rarer. And the attempt to capture these rare beasts forms a kind of hero's journey for him throughout his career. And the final key theme I want to highlight here is this emphasis on practicality. For Stevenson, good literature must serve a practical function. Rosalind Jolly writes about this very convincingly in her monograph, Stevenson in the Pacific, focusing on his later works. But again, this is a concern that's with Stevenson uh, from the very beginning. In this letter from 1874, which is the same year as Victor Hugo's romances, he writes, what a blessing work is. I don't think I could face life without it and how glad I am I took to literature. It helps me so much. We see here and elsewhere that writing had a therapeutic application for Stevenson personally as a method of self-helpful occupation. This is one of its primary practical functions to him as a writer. But what of the reader? Well, Stevenson's understanding of the value of romance in particular to its readership was fundamentally shaped by this early perception of literature as psychologically remedial. We get a window onto this in 1887's The Lantern Bearers, where he argues that, and this was quoted earlier, no man lives in the external truth among salts and acids, but in the warm phantasmagoric chamber of his brain with the painted windows and the storied walls. <laughs> 
what he's really describing here is the realm of the figurative, the realm of the imagination, the realm of romance. And this realm of romance is first and foremost identifiable for Stevenson by its capacity to elicit pleasure. Now, let's go back to that list of nine essays and run a quick but revealing experiment, uh, which is quite interesting coming off to Caroline's, um, because he does talk about pleasure in these, um, and he's not ashamed of it. So... Um, I've searched all of these essays for instances of the words please, pleasing, pleasure, pleasant, and all derivatives thereof. And a gossip on romance comes out uh, on top with 18 instances. And as may not surprise us, given Stevenson's predilections, a note on realism comes last with just one. Now, adding the word delight barely changes this at all. The lantern bearers moves up a couple of spots, but otherwise the same order is retained there. Adding the word joy shuffles a couple in the middle, but produces no change in the two uh, top spots or indeed the last place. So we can discern from this that the two things that Stevenson associates most with pleasure in literature are romance and style in that order. And as I've already argued, romance was part of Stevenson's style. His sustained perception of the inadequacy of language makes that quest element of romance intrinsic to the texture of his writing. It's where both the challenge and the pleasure lie. But the form of pleasure that Stevenson advocates for in romance is not mere escapism. So it's not the 19th century equivalent of scrolling through social media or binge watching Netflix. Um, is much more long-term and vital than that. In 1883's A Penny Plain and Twopence Coloured, which again was uh, discussed earlier, Stevenson describes his early vivid encounters with romance through the use of Skelt's juvenile drama. And this passage really illustrates the transformative and long-lasting benefits of romance as Stevenson sees them. What am I? What are life, art, letters, the world, but what my skelt has made them? The world was plain before I knew him, a poor penny world, but soon it was all coloured with romance. Indeed, out of this cut and dry, dull, swaggering, obtrusive and infantile art, I seem to have learned the very spirit of my life's enjoyment. Met there the shadows of the characters I was to read about and love in a late future. Got the romance of Der Freischutz, long ere I was to hear of Weber or the mighty Formez. Acquired a gallery of scenes and characters with which, in the silent theatre of the brain, I might enact all novels and romances, and took from these rude cuts an enduring and transforming pleasure. This echoes an earlier mention of the keen and lasting pleasure of romance found in 1882's Gossip on Romance. In this essay, he again directly links the pleasures of reading with the mode of romance. Fiction is to the grown man what play is to the child. It is there that he changes the atmosphere and tenor of his life. And when the game so chimes with his fancy that he can join in it with all his heart, when it pleases him with every turn, when he loves to recall it and dwells upon its recollection with entire delight, fiction is called romance. Play, in this sense, is not directionless frivolity, but rather creative engagement with one's environment. Skill, which once developed, remains an important mode of perception to the bearer, a literary sense that can be applied in a very practical manner to one's experience of the world. That perception is clearly undiminished nearly a decade later in 1891 when he drafts the manuscript of The Castaways of Soledad. In the aftermath of a shipwreck, his narrator extols the virtues of a fellow traveler who tells stories to boy morale. That was poetry in practice, he writes. To brighten up so desolate an outlook and transport so many persons of so great a diversity of character and mind out of their perilous and hard surroundings into the cloud country of romance. Note again there, the emphasis on uh, romance's positive utility, its psychological value, the universality of its appeal, and the modification of perspective that it can ultimately provide. Mm -hmm. 
This is not about escapist hedonism. It's about developing and safeguarding mental fortitude and a sense of well-being. For Stevenson, the pleasure of literature, and specifically romance, is curative. In 1880, he writes to John Nicoljohn that when I suffer in mind, stories are my refuge. I take them like opium, and I consider one who writes them as a sort of doctor of the mind. And frankly, it is not Shakespeare we take to when we are in a hot corner, nor certainly George Eliot, no, nor even Balzac. It is Charles Reed, or Old Dumas, or the Arabian Nights, or the best of Walter Scott. This conscious regard for the therapeutic practicality of reading romance is also reflected in Stevenson's writing of it. He likens it here to opium, suggesting both pleasurable and palliative effects of a powerful drug. And this is apt, since it's often implied within literary criticism that the effects of romance and popular literature in general are really something the reader would be better off not indulging in too much. But that is categorically not how Stevenson perceives it. Instead, as we can see here, he credits romance with healing him. Not only does he credit romance with healing him, he sets out through his fiction to return the favour. Stevenson systematically seeks to rehabilitate the ailing status of 19th century romance by splicing it with progressive elements such as self-reflexivity, contemporary settings and stylistic brevity. He develops a new strain of regenerative romance in which an enduring preoccupation with recovery manifests in a tendency towards revisiting and reworking prior structures, both his own and others. We see this clearly in the New Arabian Nights, where the story cycle of the original is given a very modern form of treatment, which then deepens in structural complexity with the dynamiter. These two draw upon the extendable energies of the original Arabian Nights, with Stevenson revisiting their structure of outgoing adventure and embedded narrative. But he's physician to much more sinister patients too, and we see this in The Master of Ballantrae and Jekyll and Hyde, where gothic romance receives a visit, and we're faced with the dark side of the mode. Rehabilitation and revisitation here is instead associated with a form of disease of horror, and instead of outward bound adventure, we've got more of an inward facing investigation of how a central malaise came to pass. So, in overview, Stevenson's valetudinarian tendencies ultimately make him a doctor of romance as well as its willing patient. Now, everything I've talked about so far is based on research that I did some years ago. Uh, what I'll close with is the direction that I'm considering taking it in the future. For those of you who read The Times in Britain, you may have noticed the recent emergence of this column by Mariella Frostrup, where she purports to solve readers' problems through what she calls the medicine of books. For all the reasons discussed, I suspect Stevenson would have thoroughly approved of this. And indeed this, this is the centre of a research into reading, literature and society at the University of Liverpool, they focus on setting the agenda for a greater evidence-based understanding of the connections between literature, health, and well-being. And it's through engaging with their work that I've dipped my toe into learning about the emergence of the medical humanities in the 1960s, long after Stevenson, and uh, specifically the foundation of bibliotherapy. For those of you who haven't heard of this, as I had not until fairly recently, in fact, can I ask for a show of hands of who, who, how many of you are already familiar with this, bibliotherapy? A couple of people. Okay, great, I'm not last of the party. That's, <laughs> that's good news. Um, this is exactly what it sounds like. It's a form of therapy using literature to improve mental health. There are two main types. One is cognitive bibliotherapy, which focuses on prescribing targeted non-fiction to individuals so that they can self-educate and improve their circumstances. It's a, essentially a self-help reading therapy uh, with minimal involvement from a professional therapist. But the other form is effective bibliotherapy. And this uses high quality fiction to help therapists and patients explore problems through identification with the characters in literary texts. And this is the area I'm much more interested in. So I now run Pannier House in Edinburgh, as Richard mentioned, which is the final remaining home of Adam Smith, 
and it's now an emergent centre for social and economic research and debate. And we're about to appoint a professorial chair in sustainable capitalism, which will deal with the economic and financial side of Smith's legacy. But it's also vital that we recouple this with the moral and philosophical aspects of Smith's work so that we can answer questions including what does it mean to flourish as an individual uh, and as a society here in the 21st century. These are questions that Smith asked back in his day. Not about the 20th century, admittedly, but that's what we need to do now. Our key focus across all our programmes is one of long-term positive change, which is how these two bits of research key in together for me. So I'd be fascinated to take this research forward and see what types of literature most reliably produce positive therapeutic benefits. Was Stevenson right? Is high quality romance with its essential difference from life, as he called it, its poetry of circumstance that has the most to offer? And if so, what implications does this have for the teaching of literature? So uh, rather than questions on this area, which I'm really just beginning to investigate, if you have any knowledge, connections, or indeed willingness to help with this in any way, please do get in touch. This is my email address, and I'll be delighted to hear from you. Thank you.